Hello, good afternoon, all my friends out there. I see you on my screen here. You can see each other, I think, too. Thanks for joining us for this day for what we expect to be a stimulating talk by Professor Douglas Allen on the effects of Gandhi's teachings on the world. My name is Stan Scott, member of the Board of Directors of Peace Action Maine. I'm here with our president, Martha Spies, and other members of the Peace Action Board. I am formerly professor of English and philosophy at the University of Maine at Presque Isle, and more recently professor in the honors program at the University of Southern Maine. Today is Rosh Hashanah in the Jewish calendar, coinciding with the birthday of the man Mohandas Gandhi, and this year at least known to his countrymen as the Mahatma, or Great Soul. As most of us are aware, are aware, Gandhi is known worldwide as the leader of the movement to free his native India from British rule, which took place in 1948. Gandhi has a stature in India comparable to figures in our own history like John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, or George Washington. Gandhi led his people to freedom by teaching millions the practice known as nonviolence or nonviolent resistance to injustice and oppression. The main instrument Gandhi taught and practiced he called Satyagraha, a word of his own invention that combines the Sanskrit term sat, which means truth, and graha, holding on. Gandhi credited his success in the liberation movements, not just to protest in the usual sense, but to his own and his followers' practice of holding on to truth. When action proceeds from the deep inner perception and adherence to truth in one's own life, that action has an uncanny power he called soul force another way of interpreting Satyagraha. As Martin Luther King Jr., probably Gandhi's most famous follower, said eloquently in his I Have a Dream speech of 1963 to address most effectively the problems of violence in our world, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. Our speaker today, known, I believe, to many of you, is a most eminent scholar of Gandhi's life and work and a fervent activist in his own right, my good friend and colleague in the University of Maine system, Doug Allen. Doug was professor of philosophy at the University of Maine for more than 45 years, retiring as recently as 2020. He is past president of the International Society for Asian and Comparative Philosophy. An award-winning teacher and scholar, Doug has authored or edited five Gandhi-informed books, including The Philosophy of Mahatma Gandhi for the 21st Century, 2008, Mahatma Gandhi, 2011, and Gandhi After 9-11, Creative Nonviolence and Sustainability, Oxford University Press, 2019. A peace and justice scholar activist, Doug Allen has been active in the civil rights movement, the Vietnam anti-war movement, the anti-apartheid movement, and many other struggles resisting violence, war, class exploitation, imperialism, racial and gender oppression, and environmental destruction. Doug will speak for approximately 40 minutes to be followed by a period of questions and answers. If you'd like to speak or raise a question for Doug, please raise your hand or hit the reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and hit a second button for raise your hand. Uh, this talk is being recorded, but the recording will stop during the Q&A period. Uh, you may also uh, enter a comment 
uh, that I presume everyone will be able to read in the chat line. Also, a button found at the bottom of your screen. So, without further ado, representing the members and friends of Peace Action Maine, I invite you in virtual applause to welcome Doug Allen to our virtual speaker's podium. Doug? Yeah. Okay. The floor is yours, my friend. Okay. Thank you, Stan. I want to thank uh, Martha and Stan, uh, others at Peace Action Maine for inviting me uh, to give this presentation. What I'll try to do is uh, to give um, my presentation in ways uh, that uh, are personally engaging. Uh, when I finish, what I hope will be lively, challenging, and also controversial, uh, I'll welcome your questions, uh, comments, agreements, and disagreements that will generate a meaningful discussion and that I hope will stay with you long after our Zoom session ends. So uh, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, uh, better known as, by his honorific title Mahatma Gandhi, was born on October 2nd, 1869 in Porbandar, India, which is in the state of Gujarat. And Porbandar is on the western coast of India the Arabian Sea, part of the Indian Ocean. Gandhi was assassinated on January 30th, 1948 in New Delhi, India, five months after um, India uh, achieved formal independence uh, with the partition of India and Pakistan. Partition divided um, Pakistan into West Pakistan, which remains as Pakistan, and East Pakistan, which in 1971 became Bangladesh on the uh, Bay of Bengal, uh, the eastern coast of India. October 2nd, Gandhi's birthday is celebrated uh, as Gandhi Johanti, one of the uh, three national holidays in India. The first national holiday is August 15th. Uh, that's India's Independence Day, which commemorates August 15th, 1947, when India was declared independent from the United, uh, United Kingdom and British rule, British colonial rule. The second national holiday, January 26th, is India's Republic Day, which commemorates uh, January 26, 1950, when India adopted its constitution and a transition to a republic. The third national holiday, October 2nd today, is Gandhi Jahanti, which commemorates October 2nd, 1869, Gandhi's birthday, and how Gandhi, as the honored Bapu, or father of the nation, led the victorious nonviolent freedom and independence movement. Since Gandhi is the world's most influential proponent of nonviolence, the United Nations appropriately recognizes today, October 2nd, as the UN International Day of Nonviolence. Although he was and continues to be the most admired human being in India, and probably in the entire world, Gandhi was controversial and remains so today. With the, with the experiences of having written books and articles on Gandhi and the experiences of attempting to put 
Gandhi informed values into practice, I'll share with you some of Gandhi's insightful, complex, and sometimes contradictory views and applications of nonviolence, peace, and other major values and ideas. I believe that a selective creative approach to Mahatma Gandhi can provide us with motivation, resistance, resilience, and hope in our lives and for a better future. So in my presentation today, you'll see there'll be many challenges that will arise from what I'll uh, share with you. And one central challenge, which I feel, and I would guess all of you feel, experience deeply, is the following. On the one hand, when we look at this world, what's in the US, in the Middle East, in India, all over the world, uh, uh, we can easily see why nonviolence and peace are so necessary. And we also hope that they will be effect relevant and effective. On the other hand, though, when we look at this world of so much violence, conflict, and war, and hatred, we can see why nonviolence and peace are lofty ideals, but at times they seem so irrelevant and so ineffective in dealing with our world. And I know many, for example, will just say, I'll say, how are you doing? And they'll say, everything is falling apart. I feel so powerless. I feel so hopeless. I feel that nothing I can do makes any difference in terms of uh, the crises, the existential crises that we face every day. Now, on Gandhi, uh, Johanti, Indian leaders, including the Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, and others, they assemble at Gandhi's birthplace and throughout India in order to pay ritualized homage to this remarkable Indian, speakers ritually extol the larger-than-life M.K. Gandhi as Bapu, father of the nation, and the Mahatma, the great political, moral, and spiritual soul. Many ex extol Gandhi as the idealized Hindu who used uh, ideologically to justify Hindu identity and Hindu-informed politics and policies and actions in India and in the Indian diaspora in the USA and elsewhere. Now, if Gandhi were alive today, how would he regard the, cele the celebratory reverence toward him? I'll suggest Gandhi would be very disturbed. I submit that Gandhi remains the most admired person uh, and the most influential proponent of Ahimsa, but he was controversial during his lifetime and he remains even more controversial today. Gandhi, his teachings and his actions are interpreted in so many contradictory ways. I'll discuss briefly four general classifications of current interpreters in India and elsewhere who regard Gandhi in ways that I'll suggest render him irrelevant. I'll maintain that Gandhi's values, teachings, practices, and message with regard to violence and nonviolence are more relevant and desperately needed today than ever before in confronting issues of violence, hatred, class exploitation, and inequality. 
gender, racial, ethnic, and religious oppression, immorality, untruthfulness, and environmental unsustainability. But Gandhi is so relevant only if we reinterpret and reapply his message selectively, rejecting what is reactionary and irrelevant, reformulating <clears throat> Gandhi's legacies in ways that are contextually relevant today, and integrating Gandhian perspectives with complementary non-Gandhi contributions. So here are four general classifications that I think render Gandhi irrelevant, and within which you have many different positions. First, there are dedicated Gandhian devotees in ashrams and other interpreters who admire, extol, and sometimes deify the Mahatma. For them, Gandhi is the saintly, perfected, exemplary Mahatma, and his writings and teachings are the scriptures, providing us with the perfect nonviolent blueprint. With all of the solutions for our personal and worldly problems, Unfortunately, as was the case during his lifetime, and as remains true today, they claim and regard Gandhi as too good for this world. And we continue to ignore his perfect nonviolent teachings and practices, resulting in our anti-Gandhian world of so much violence. Not only, I would maintain, that does this make Gandhi largely irrelevant, but it violates Gandhi's own understanding of himself and his teachings and principles informing his life and his actions. Second, what at first seems like the opposite, there is a wide variety of diverse anti-Gandhian critics. But they also present a rigid, absolute, decontextualized Gandhi. However, for the anti Gandhians, Gandhi's so called perfect nonviolent solutions are no solutions at all. At best, Gandhi was well intentioned, but naive and unrealistic. At worst, he was and remains complicit with and part of the problem of violent caste oppression, class exploitation, gender and ethnic oppression, and much more. He and his philosophy are obstacles to progress. Third, there are the economically and practical, uh, politically powerful modern Indians who Gandhi identifies with violent, quote, modern civilization in Hinswaraj. These are non-Gandhian and anti-Gandhian expressions of the corporate and financial capitalist elite, top scientists and engineers and medical experts, those promoting fossil fuels and military and nuclear domination, and those with the power shaping mass media and the dominant culture. Today, these modern human beings identify with neoliberal corporate capitalism, profit maximization, globalization, ego-driven materialism and consumerism, worship of technology, militarism, and multi-dimensional forms of violence and the domination of nature. For them in their worldview, Gandhi is at most a minor, minor irritant and is largely irrelevant. Fourth, there are leading political and economic figures, political parties, and many others, influential Indians who now extol Gandhi as an exceptional Indian, as a great Hindu, 
but they use Gandhi to justify their anti-Gandhi and violent values, policies, and goals. In the past, many of these same Indian leaders and groups viciously attacked Gandhi as a traitor, an enemy of Hindu India, who weakened Indians, who was responsible for partition and Kashmir, who preferred Muslims over Indi Hindus, and much more. Today, on Gandhiji's birthday and other occasions, they extol the Mahatma, but they use this ideologically to defect attention away from their extreme anti-Gandhian, violent, intolerant, divisive, political, economic, military, nuclear, and other priorities, values, policies, and objectives. Okay, so what I'd like to do is to share with you br briefly two key features of Gandhi's message, approach and significance, right? Um, and then I'd like to share what are the two key concepts, principles uh, in Gandhi's, all of Gandhi's philosophy, practices, and uh, activism. So uh, the two key uh, principles I just wanted to share, uh, one is uh, the Gandhi's key focus on ethics, on morality, and the other is his key focus on the primacy of practice. Um, and uh, Gandhi uh, is primarily, in my interpretation and in thousands of his writings, he's primarily an ethicist who um, for, uh, focuses on the primacy of morality. Gandhi is mainly concerned that we live a virtuous life, that human beings live with character, that they are kind, they are compassionate, they are loving, they uh, care about the suffering of others, uh, and, and so forth. So for Gandhi, this is the primary focus he has, much more than are you a Hindu, are you a Muslim, are you a Christian, are you a Jew, or uh, um, he's, are you an atheist, uh, an agnostic? Gandhi's mainly concerned with how you live, do you live morally, right? Uh, do you live with love, with kindness, with compassion, truthfully, and so forth? The second thing uh, feature is Gandhi focuses on the primacy of practice. Gandhi, in everything I'll share, he's not mainly concerned with some absolute, abstract, universal, value or principle or concept, Gandhi is concerned with how you live your life. In other words, uh, the ideals for Gandhi of truth, of nonviolence, and so forth, they're all very, very important, but only as guides to action. In other words, they're only important how they're activa act activated in terms of uh, how you live. And in fact, whether in fact, contextually, this uh, is transformative in allowing you to be motivated, resilient, resistant, and, and to work to transform the suffering, the immorality, the untruth, and so forth that we find in our lives in our world. Now, I want to uh, share the two main concepts in Gandhi's entire philosophy, Satya and Ahimsa. And Gandhi has many other major concepts as well. But in uh, thousands of passages, he says, these are the two and interrelated, interchangeable key concepts, principles, presuppositions, uh, in his entire message and his philosophy and his practices. 
So the first one, Satya, as was mentioned, Satya, the way Gandhi uses this, Satya is translated as truth, which also um, he uses interchangeably uh, with being, with a capital B. Satya is not just some, some abstract principle, it's a force for Gandhi. It's a truth force that actually is powerful. It's a very powerful force in a transformative way in terms of how we live our lives. So um, what in, in terms of Gandhi's view of satya, truth, it brings out the kind of organic, holistic, interconnectedness of all of life, of all of reality, right? So for Gandhi, in his basic view of human beings, of nature, of the cosmos, of truth uh, on all levels, morally, spiritually, socially, economically, politically, culturally, and so forth, for Gandhi, this brings out this kind of holistic, organic view of the interconnectedness of all of life, the oneness, the unity of all of life. But for Gandhi, this is a unity with a respect for perspectival differences that are all, in other words, your truth may not be identical always in terms of our spatial, temporal, historical, cultural, economic world, what you experience as truth may not be identical with what is truth for me, but then we can see how all these different perspectives are interconnected in terms of a greater whole. So this is one thing to keep in mind in Gandhi. And then the second thing for which Gandhi is most known, of course, is ahimsa, which means no harm, no injury, and is translated usually as nonviolence. And for Gandhi, uh, once again, as with truth, ahimsa, nonviolence is a force. It's not just some abstract essence. It's a force. In fact, he thinks it's the most powerful force that we can experience and activate in our own lives, in our own world. So Gandhi uh, broadens and deepens our understanding of nonviolence. Uh, and I'll suggest, as I've done in my writings, the uh, two key ways I see that he does this, that really just qualitatively change uh, uh, our whole perspective, our understanding of violence and nonviolence. Because it, on one level, it's easy to get people to grant, probably everyone here listening to me you now would easily grant, well, you know, uh, nonviolence is better than violence. Peace is better than war. Love is better than hatred. Kindness is uh, caring or better than cruelty, callousness. Justice is better than injustice, and so forth. It's easy to grant that. The challenge, that, and then most people qualify, they say, unfortunately, we live in a world where sometimes uh, you have to just think about yourself. You have to be selfish. You have to, uh, sometimes war is necessary for peace, Some, and so forth. So we qualify that. Uh, Gandhi challenges us. Gandhi says that most of us who consider ourselves nonviolent are actually very violent. And most of us who claim that we're for peace, actually, we are complicit whether we perpetuate or we benefit from war. So how can Gandhi say this? So uh, the two ways that I've shown that Gandhi broadens and deepens this, he's, Gandhi says, in it, when we talk about we're against violence for peace, we usually restrict this to overt 
physical violence. In other words, I'm against torture. I'm against rape. I'm against the uh, uh, killing of innocent civilians and so forth. So it's kind of overt physical violence. Gandhi, of course, is against that. He was assassinated in an act of overt physical violence. But what Gandhi says is that, well, over 95% of our violence is not overt physical violence. So what Gandhi talks about is the multidimensionality of violence. In addition to overt physical violence, we have inner violence. We have psych psychological violence. For Gandhi, hatred is violent. We have economic violence. Gandhi spends tremendous amount of time how the economic haves use their economic power in a hierarchical way to dominate and exploit the have-nots. Gandhi talks about cultural violence, religious violence, educational violence, social violence, environmental violence. And what Gandhi says, all these dimensions of violence interact, how we're socialized, and they mutually reinforce each other, so that finally we accept views of human nature, ourself, our world, and so forth, that are very violent. The second uh, feature that I bring out is Gandhi talks about uh, the structural violence of the set status quo that most of us do not even recognize as violent. And Gandhi says, when our economic system is functioning smoothly without disruption, it is very violent. When much of our hierarchical religious institutional systems are functioning without overt disruption, resistance, they're very violent. Gandhi, and in each of these areas I went through multidimensionally, Gandhi says we tend to be socialized in a way that we simply accept the status quo as the way things are. That's real politic, that's a life. Um, and Gandhi wants to challenge that, okay? That, and when you combine the multidimensionality of violence with the structural violence of the status quo, this basically burst open how we understand violence and nonviolence. So in that regard, uh, let me say that I, I found over the decades, uh, there's a common view of violence and nonviolence, sometimes connected with Gandhi, with the Dalai Lama, with um, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, with various scriptural figures. And what it, the view is this, uh, I, I believe in nonviolence and peace, which means that we should avoid conflict. What we need is inner peace, inner peace, being peaceful, okay? And of course, there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, because we know the consequence often when people are full of rage and have no inner peace and so forth. But a key distinction that Martin Luther King Jr. makes that he got from Gandhi, Gandhi makes the same thing, is the difference between a negative and a positive peace. And King says that most of what we call peace is a negative peace. And that is basically a peace without justice. And it's no peace at all. It's a very passive acceptance. Uh, and that uh, this is very different from a positive peace. A positive peace is active. It involves uh, consciousness raising, resistance, activism, transformative, uh, establishing a peace with justice. So the challenge here is, uh, in Gandhi's view of nonviolence, uh, conflict and active resistance are not the opposite of nonviolence and peace. Peace is not simply accepting the violence of the structural 
status quo peacefully, passively. For Gandhi, peace involves disruption, active disruption, embracing conflict, which can usually is very violent and destructive, but not necessarily. For Gandhi, the model here, he uses a medical image. And it, you could use the image here of cancer. They use this. If someone points out to you a cancer, that can be uh, not peaceful at all. And it can produce a lot of stress. And you shoo them away. You don't want to hear that. But what Gandhi is saying, it's only by recognizing the cancer, and for him, violence, hatred, or a cancer, that one then can attempt to gain awareness of it and bring it to the surface and transform it to overcome the cancer. Okay, So for Gandhi, the current dominant hatred, divisiveness, and dehumanization of others as essentially other and not like us is violent. Economic and social inequality between the haves and have nots is essentially violent. Humanly created and maintained poverty is violent. The construction of the immoral and untruthful moder modern ego-defined individual with its ego desires and attachments and possessiveness is essentially violent. Xenophobic state nationalism is violent. The dominant hierarchical, institutionalized economic, political, social, cultural, media, religious, class, caste, gendered, and educational systems are multidimensionally and structurally violent. They reject the inclusivistic, interconnected, egalitarian, decentralized, substantively democratic, multi-sided, tolerant, moral, and truthful basis of Gandhi's vision, teachings, and practices for today. For Gandhi, modern human beings with their modern views that the ends justify the means accept the immoral and untruthful view that we can use means that involve control, violence, militarism, oppression, exploitation, modern ends of wealth, power, uh, um, to achieve modern ends of and of power, wealth, hierarchical, racist, gendered, religious, and other domination, and other objectives. This often involves the ideological justifications by appealing to anti-Gandhian concepts of peace that is really unjust and violence, materialistically defined development, and modern criteria for happiness and prosperity. In Gandhi's interpretation of violence and nonviolence, we are socialized today to max, to accept the assumptions and values of neoliberal corporate capitalism, profit maximization, globalization, ego-driven materialism and consumerism, worship of technology, militarism, multidimensional forms of violence, and the exploitation and domination of nature. I want to uh, just briefly offer one distinction that for me uh, makes Gandhi uh, more real, effective uh, in dealing with issues of violence and war and conflict and hatred and so forth. This is a distinction often made between the absolute and the relative. And it appears throughout Gandhi's writings. And many uh, interpreters, uh, including many of the devotees, admirers, they focus on passages you can find throughout Gandhi in his autobiography and other writings 
where he talks about these wonderful absolute ideals, right? The absolute ideal of perfect ahimsa, perfect nonviolence, the absolute ideal of perfect morality, the uh, perfect truth, right? Perfect love, perfect kindness, perf perfect satyagraha, perfect swaraj or uh, uh, freedom, and, and, and in all these areas. And these are wonderful ideals. And the problem is, by focusing on those, it seems to make Gandhi ineffective in dealing with the existential crises that we're facing today in all these ways. So what I want to suggest is this. Gandhi says 95% of the time when we are violent, there are nonviolent options. Either we're unaware of them or they make us too uncomfortable, they challenge us. But 95% of the time, we have nonviolent options. However, there are cases, many of which we're experiencing all of us today, in which there don't seem to be any effective nonviolent options. And Gandhi has hundreds and hundreds of pages on this. For example, he writes so many articles on what to do about menacing monkeys, uh, which is in India, many of us have experienced menacing monkeys, uh, which can be life-threatening. And Gandhi says, you try to do everything else, but in some cases, he says, you have to kill them. And that may be the most nonviolent thing you can do. He talks about the mad dog, right, with rabies. Gandhi talks about the rapist, the person who's engaged in raping people. And better to have dialogue, engage, empathy. Trans but person may not be interested in any of that. You have to stop the rapist even if that involves physical force, uh, you know, because that's the most nonviolent thing you can do. And these are the examples always thrown at Gandhi. What would you do about a Hitler? What do you do about 9-11? What do you do after I was in India for a year working uh, right after the uh, uh, terrorism in uh, 2008? in uh, Bombay, in Mumbai. What do you do about those terrorists who are shooting people, killing people in the train station, in the hotels, and so forth? So what I found is in Gandhi's writings, and it makes Gandhi much more open to dialogue and transform. Gandhi says there are some cases in which there are, unfortunately, we live in a contextualized world, in which there are cases where there is not a nonviolent option. And certain violent responses may be the most nonviolent thing you can do. But when you do that, never glorify the violence. The fact that we were in those situations, it's tragic. It's a sign of human failure. So minimize the violence, no collateral damage, no killing of innocent people, torturing. Minimize the violent response in terms of its intensity, its duration, what is necessary to do to stop the violence, and then mainly do everything in your power to change the economic, social, political, cultural, religious, environmental, and other conditions that gave rise to that violence so that you don't keep replicating, using terror to overcome terror and then being trapped in an endless world of terror, okay? So that is uh, makes Gandhi a lot more real. Um, and the um, I'll just conclude by saying that uh, Gandhi-informed thought philosophy and practices are certainly relevant, I would suggest, indeed more relevant than ever in addressing the current crises of war, conflict, hatred, divisiveness, exploitation, inequality, caste and gender and racial and ethnic and religious oppression, 
imperialism, xenophobic nationalism, alienation, and the lack of human flourishing, economic and environment, environmental unsustainability. What is now needed, in my view, is for us to engage Gandhi through creatively selective readings, interpretations, and applications, and open-ended, dynamic, contextually relevant re-readings, reinterpretations, and reapplications. In doing this, we honor Gandhi and his legacy while recognizing that Gandhi does not have all of the answers, that he has not provided us with some fixed, absolute, perfect blueprint of nonviolence, truth, morality, with the solutions for all of our violent and other crises. We must integrate our Gandhian approaches, perspectives, philosophies, and practices with complementary non-Gandhian approaches that have valuable insights with regard to contemporary crises focusing on class and caste, race and gender, religious and communal conflict, science, medicine, technology, and environmental unsustainability. In my view, what is needed now is how we best address our contemporary crises and how we shall be able to provide positive, moral, nonviolent, truthful, Gandhi-informed alternatives. The challenge is this, and I'll end with this. Um, for me, Gandhi, in many ways, is a catalyst. It's a little bit like Socrates. Gandhi is a gadfly. Gandhi disturbs us. Gandhi throughout his life, even his closest allies like Nehru and others, so many who loved and admired Gandhi, they never knew what to do with him because he was always disrupting their normal comf comfort level. He was always thinking and acting outside the box. So as he did throughout his lifetime, Gandhi not only offers us a theoretical analysis of violence, but he also mainly offers action-oriented practice, which challenges us to raise our transformative consciousness, to mobilize unifying nonviolent moral and truthful resistance, and to create positive Gandhi-informed contemporary alternatives. As during his lifetime, Gandhi's legacy today is to serve as a catalyst to make our, us deeply uncomfortable with dominant modern life that is so violent, so that we are motivated to reimagine, reconceptualize, recontextualize, creatively and selectively reformulate and reapply how to live nonviolently, morally, truthfully, and sustainably in our world and for the future. So, um, actually, I think I'm within a minute of the time <laughs> that I uh, thought I would end. So, let me, at this point, I want to thank you. And Well, thank you, Doug. I'm sorry. I, my, I had a technical glitch there, and I was oh. unable to unmute myself <laughs> or come back on the video. But here <laughs> I am. So, okay. thank you all, those of us yeah. who stayed the course here today. It's been a great, a great afternoon. Doug. Right.